I am Ahab, and the Hoffa case is my white whale. So here we are 44 years later, and I'm still looking for him. I had a gun rammed down my throat. Uh, I've been in uh, at least at least a half a dozen fights, really nasty fights. The first time I got, I got really beaten up was uh, in April of 1975. It was a couple of months before Hoffa disappeared. So I had been investigating this goon squad that was running around shaking down trucking companies, uh, the leader of which I think was involved in the disposal of Hoffa's body. And um, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Pittsburgh wanted me to cooperate with the grand jury investigation they were doing. And I said, you know, I'm a journalist, you know, you do your work, I'll do mine, you make your own cases. And then the guy threatened my dad, who was like one of my favorite people in the world. And uh, that really upset me. So I went to the, the uh, U.S. Attorney and I said, what do you need? And um, so I started cooperating with the grand jury investigation. And in the midst of this, I got a call from a Teamster official who had been cooperating with me in the South. And he told me that he was present at a meeting where a contract was placed out on me. And the contract was for $1,500. And when I thought about this, you know, I was more in, 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 insulted by the price that I was horrified by the fact that it was a contract out on me. There's a long story associated with this. In the end, uh, the, the investigation was actually being run by the Strike Force Against Organized Crime in Pittsburgh. The, it was right at the end of the Ford administration as Jimmy Carter was coming in in 1977. There was a, um, it, during the transition, the head of the criminal division for the old Ford Justice Department wiped out the strike forces in five cities, claiming there was no organized crime in those cities, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, St. Louis, San Diego, and, and New Orleans. Uh, and because Pittsburgh uh, was wiped out, uh, the grand jury left, and these guys were uh, not indicted. And, and I think that's the reason why I'm alive today. The guy who had the contract ended up taking a shot at me out on the canal, um, on the towpath. I used to jog uh, every day when I lived here in the neighborhood. And, um, and a guy came out of the bushes and opened up on me. It was an intentional miss. His job was to scare me. It worked. And um, I, um, you know, I remember that moment well. I thought the mafia had been wiped out by Elliot Ness and the Untouchables during the 30s. I didn't think they existed. Seeing that they did, I started investigating crime stuff. And then there was a, uh, a great man named uh, Bill Ellis, who was uh, an attorney for, uh, he, he was one of the junior attorneys for the NAACP in Board of Education, Brown v. Board of Education. And um, he owned a little newspaper in my hometown, Akron, Ohio, called The Reporter, which serviced the black community in Northeast Ohio. And so Bill asked me if I wanted to be a token white columnist for his newspaper, and of course I agreed to. I needed a job, I got a whopping $15 a column. And so I started writing about crime, organized crime, the Teamsters Union. So I was writing about Hoffa and the Teamsters about eight months before Hoffa disappeared on July 30th, 1975. So when it was announced that Hoffa disappeared, I hit the ground running. I wound up I, I wound up doing a, a crazy uh, thing with uh, my friend John Quitney from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we went looking for Jimmy Hoffa, thinking he was alive. Of course, he wasn't, but we had a real adventure uh, with that situation. And then uh, uh, John went back to the newsroom at the Wall Street Journal in New York to take all the flack he was going to take from his colleagues at the newspaper. Meantime, I went to Detroit. I had $2 cash and a credit card in my pocket. So I hitchhiked to uh, the Red Fox restaurant where Hoffa was last seen. And when I walked in there, I saw Irving R. Levine, the great labor economics reporter for NBC with the bow tie. So I was hired by NBC and I basically helped run their investigation during the early two, three weeks of the, of the, um, uh, a, in the aftermath of the disappearance. I was sent to New York for a couple of weeks to do some specials for NBC. They asked me if I wanted to stay and work get a job as a researcher, an associate producer, or something like that. But I said, you know, I'm going to stay with this Hoffa case. I was in competition. There was another 28-year-old named Steve Brill, who uh, was, a, was a legal columnist for Esquire magazine. And he had come out with a book called The Teamsters, which was a very fine book. And he and I were in a pretty rugged competition. The head of Simon & Schuster decided and told the New Republic, we're not distributing your book. The New York Times stepped into the picture. Heard, hearing about this attempted suppression of this book on Hoffa, 
And so the literary, the chief literary critic of the New York Times uh, did a story that came out on June 29, 1978. I consider it to be my birth certificate, that story, because that was the day I was created as an author. It was such a great story about me that I, my book on that day, um, uh, about three months before publication, it was the New York Times bought US rights to the book, London Observer bought international rights, Playboy magazine published a long, long excerpt from the book, um, Book of the Month Club picked it up, and they had choices of all, uh, you know, of both books, and they were picking mine left and right. So it worked out pretty well for me at 28. I was lucky I was in the right place at the right time, and here I am, all these years later, I'm still involved in the Hoffa case, even though I've written nine books total and only one about Hoffa, but it was my first. The Hoffa murder was a three-act drama with different characters in each act. In act one, Hoffa goes to the Red Fox restaurant in Bloomfield Township, just north of Detroit, expecting to meet two mafia guys, Tony Giacalone of Detroit, Tony Provenzano of uh, New Jersey. Um, somebody picks him up. There's a hundred theories as to who picks him up. I've got mine. Act two, he's taken to some place, a location, where he's murdered. Uh, there are a hundred, uh, in Act One, Phil Moscato, the guy who owns Moscato's dump where Hoffa's body is buried, he tells me that Vito Giacalone is the guy who's driving the car that takes Hoffa to the scene of his murder. Vito Giacalone is the brother of Tony Giacalone, one of the guys Hoffa expects to meet. Hoffa's murdered by Sal Bergoglio, by Salvador Bergoglio, a top henchman, top lieutenant to Tony Provenzano. Act Three, his body's disposed of. Now, in 1975, Five days after the murder, Steve Andretta, one of the alleged co-conspirators in the Hoffa case, visits a friend of his in jail, a guy named Ralph Picardo. He was doing 20 years for manslaughter. He was in Trenton State Penitentiary. And during their conversation, Steve told him about what happened to Hoffa, allegedly. And Steve waited about three or four months. I don't know why he waited that long uh, when he was looking at 20 years in jail, but he went to the FBI, flipped, turned state's evidence. And during his recitation to the FBI, he said that Hoffa had been murdered in Detroit. He had been stuffed into a 55-gallon drum. He was loaded onto a gateway transportation truck and shipped to New Jersey. When they said, did he say who killed him? And he said, no, Steve didn't tell me who killed him. But being part of the Provenzano operation, I know that Hoffa was a target of Pro Tony Pro and that Tony Pro had put a contract out on Hoffa either in late 1973 or early 1974, and he gave the contract to Sal Bergoglio. Uh, then, they, then they said, when he brought him back to New Jersey, they say where they buried him, and he said, no, but when we, when we killed somebody, or we were, de we were dealing with a dead body, we buried him at Brother Moscato's dump. And so the FBI did a search at Brother Moscato's dump. It was 54 acres, toxic waste, dogs, rats, quicksand, and it was December, where the ground's hard and everything else. They gave that up because they didn't know where to begin looking. There's thousands of 55-gallon drums there. I give Phil Moscato a call. He says, come on up. So I take a trip up to New Jersey. I meet him. I meet his wife. And um, they're very nice. And uh, he tells me that Hoffa's body was buried at his dump. He tells me that Vito Giacalone drove the car that drove Hoffa to the scene of his crime, and he told me that Sal Bergoglio was the killer. But other than that, he was giving me, um, he was giving me information about the Hoffa case with the same frequency that a kosher butcher sells pork sausages. So I was in a position where uh, I had this mafia guy who trusted me and, I, and respected me and treated me with respect, and I treated him with respect. And so when and I was, and I, right up to the time he died in, in February 2014, I was calling him on the phone trying to get him to tell me the whole story before he died. And he just couldn't do it. But he told his son on his deathbed, this is what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. Work with Dan Day, You can trust him. Phil Moscato Jr. is the one who's saying that the body was at the dump and, and it was moved to this other location in the Meadowlands, this parking lot in the Meadowlands. So that's kind of where we're at right now.
De Niro had bought the rights to a book called I Heard You Paid Houses in 2007. Uh, this was a book that came out in 2004, and it was about uh, the life and times of a guy named Frank Sheeran, who was an alleged hitman who had claimed in this book that he had murdered Jimmy Hoffa, among other murders that he claimed to commit that he did not commit. And uh, uh, Eric Sean from Fox News was shepherding the book through the process and very enthusiastically uh, getting behind the book. And he asked me to be, uh, to be on his team to sign an NDA to read the book and to give my opinion about it. So I did. I signed the NDA. I read the book. My comment at the time was this could be the most important break in the Hoffa case since Hoffa disappeared. But there's a lot of things in here that are just flat out not true. And the, and the key is going to be separating fact from fiction. He did not kill Jimmy Hoffa. And De Niro getting Marty Scorsese involved in this, and then Al Pacino and then Joe Pesci and then Harvey Keitel getting this tremendous cast together to get behind this book, saying this is the story of what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. And the author was putting up a website saying something like Hoffa Murder Solved or something like dot com. And I'm going, wait a minute here. I don't know anybody in the FBI. I don't know any prosecutors who are saying that this case has been solved. This case has not been solved. I've hosted an author's dinner here in Washington for twice a year, first Tuesday in June, first Tuesday in December, for 30 years. And uh, De Niro came, he couldn't have been nicer, he was terrific, he posed for a thousand pictures that night, he was such a good sport. But at this, at this uh, we, we sort of peeled off and went and sat at this table, and there was a photograph of the meeting. And I, I talked to De Niro the way he talks to people in the movies, and when he started giving me this noise about this is the book that solves the Jimmy Hoffa disappearance, you know, I, I, I got very aggressive with him. I said, listen, you're talking to the world's expert on the Hoffa case, and I play second banana to nobody on this case, and you're getting conned, Bob. And uh, he took offense. It, it was some very harsh language between us. Uh, and in the end, um, um, we did not part as friends, to say the least. But um, I liked and respected the guy. I, um, uh, he, he, a, lot of, a, a lot of what I said about him getting conned was in a story in Slate. And then the story sort of circulated. Now it's all over. Vanity Fair picked it up and everything else. And then De Niro chimed in. And De Niro's reaction was, Dan is a very respected uh, writer. Uh, he's, he's an expert on the Hoffa case, and yes, he said, I, he told me I was going to get conned, but no, I wasn't conned. I, I believe this. I believe that this guy did it. Uh, De Niro went on CBS Sunday morning. He said, I believe this. He, this is the guy who did it. This is, the, this is the case. When De Niro and Scorsese saw this negative thing that was coming down on them, uh, they started with their uh, literary license dodge, their artistic license dodge, where, oh, well, th we just bought a book, the rights to a book, and we took the main character, and we made him our character. And so, once again, this artistic license dodge has now eclipsed the, these, this guy did it, and this is the final solution to the Hoffa case. Corsese's flat out saying, we fictionalized the character, and I'm cool with that. Uh, and I respect the fact that they're admitting it. My problem is with, 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 was with De Niro not admitting it. Now he's finally, again, embracing the artistic license dodge. And, and to me, that's the most honest approach. Meantime, I Heard You Paint Houses has just gone to number one on the New York Times paperback nonfiction, nonfiction list. So is this a great country or what? I'm being very pragmatic here when I say that uh, I'm picking my battles very carefully. And I don't want to battle with Scorsese, De Niro, Pacino, Keitel, Ray Romano, Steve Zalen, who wrote the screenplay and won an Oscar for uh, Schindler's List previously. That is not a fight I want because that's a fight I'm going to get creamed if I engage that fight. So my position is I love the movie because A, it's putting Jimmy Hoffa back on the radar screen, and B, it's putting me back in the game. And it's, and it's allowing me to strut my stuff for everything that I've been doing on trying to solve this murder over the past 44 years. And um, 
I don't know if, if the case ever, once and for all, is going to be solved, but I think it's very possible that Act 3 of the case, the disposal of Hoffa's body, is on the verge of being solved, and uh, we're in the midst of investigating that right now. And, um, and hopefully, um, if we could get the law enforcement community, which has been snake bit by all the searches they've done previously, uh, if we could get the law enforcement community to come into this, and, because we can't, right now, I've engaged in criminal trespass in the two places that I've been to go to the exact spot. And one story, one person is saying that Hoffa's body was buried at Brother Moscato's dump, and it is still there. And another person is saying that the body was buried at Brother Moscato's dump, but when they heard Ralph Picardo was cooperating with the FBI and it had, and it had, had, had named Moscato's dump as the final resting place for Hoffa, that they dug the body up and moved it to this parking lot in the Meadowlands. Now, you know, I've been to both spots. I filmed both spots and I have interviewed the guys at length. The one guy I'm waiting for him to sign a sworn statement to, uh, 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 to uh, take responsibility for what he said under oath, under a penalty of perjury. The other guy who says the body is here and this guy um, has signed a sworn statement. I have, he has executed a sworn statement for me under the penalty of perjury. And this story is going to blow people's minds when they see this. I mean, there's no way you can look at this and say, you know, this is not true. I had been, I had, I, like I said, I've done six of these before. And the, and the last one I had done in 2009, I got, I got suckered. My position has been every seven to 10 years, if some mob guy comes to me, with some some story about about Hoffa's body, I'm willing if the if the cast of characters right and the timelines right and the moon and the stars are in the right place, I'm willing to pay to throw a th couple of thousand dollars away in a few weeks to go run down the lead. Whether it's Brother Moscato, whom I interviewed exclusively, whether it's Sal and Gabe Bergulio and Tommy and Stevie Andretta, who are the alleged killers in Jimmy Hoffa's case, I'm the only person who's gone to them and, and interviewed them on tape for three and a half hours. Uh, whether it's Frank Sheeran, whom I interviewed in 1978, you know, I will still get out there and, and, and fight these things out. I mean, just what I just did, getting to Brother Moscato's dump, and going to the exact location, let me tell you, man, this was hard to get into this place. And uh, I, I was shaking. I was shaking when I was in there, not so much because I was afraid I was going to get whacked, uh, but because I was afraid we were going to be arrested because we were trespassing. I was afraid of the fact that this dump, which was a, a target of an EPA cleanup, uh, was that I was going to get attacked by wild dogs or rats or quick, I was going to get sunk in quicksand or I was going to, um, you know, again, it's a toxic waste up. It's hell on earth. And, uh, but I went there and I'm almost 70 years old and doggone it, I'm still willing to, to, take, to take these things on. I am determined to solve this goddamn case. I thought the film was wonderful. I thought it was, I get five stars of five stars. I thought, um, it was a walk down memory lane because I, when I went to see the film, I accepted it for what it was. It was fiction. It was, um, it was about the life and times of a pathological liar who claimed to have committed murders that he did not commit for the cynical purpose of trying to make money at the end of his life. Uh, and um, so going into it with that understanding, I enjoyed the three and a half hours of the movie. I think the world should see it. But once again, I don't think that the world is going to come to a, uh, a national debate as to whether Sal Bergoglio or Frank Sheeran killed Jimmy Hoffa. This is like the Amelia Earhart disappearance. This is one of the most celebrated disappearances in the history of the world, and, um, and certainly, certainly the history of America. And this is, this is arguably uh, the biggest mob hit of all times as well. And uh, once again, I am... You know, I'm, I, I, there's no justice in this world if I'm not there at the denouement of this case where I'm there when this case is solved. And I am determined to be there if the body is at this place. You know, I'm not willing to bet my life on this, but I am pushing all in on this. I'm saying this is where I think it is. And that's a bold, that's a bold bet to make at this point. Boy, this goes back to when I was 24 years old in 1974 and was it worth it?
it, it probably worked out as well as it can work out for me. So do I regret, have any regrets? I got a lot of regrets. But um, would I do it all over again, given the same set of circumstances? I probably would. It's been a real adventure, that's for sure.